Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Meanahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Hey peeps, today we're going to take a look at Hunt, the Unknown Quarry from Victory Point Games. Now, this game is from Jeremy Leonard, who is the designer of Darkest Night, which uh, I like a couple of Victory Point games, but that is the one I like the most. In fact, it's in my top 100. Great fantasy cooperative game, so I was eager to play this one, to be sure. And the theme is solid as well. Uh, you and the other players are sort of, I guess, old-timey. It looks like it's set back in like the 50s or something. Um, but you're like investigators who are going to this creepy old mansion because there's a monster to be taken care of but of course dun 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 one of you is that monster but you don't know what kind so it's really tough to fight a monster that you don't know what its weaknesses are what its strengths are i mean think of like procedural monster of the week shows like supernatural or buffy the vampire slayer where they have to find out what its weakness is before you can kill it that is much of the game but i don't want to get want to give you the impression that this is a cooperative game Rather, this is a fully competitive game. I wouldn't even call it semi-co-op, although you might incidentally help each other sometimes. One of the Hunter players wants to be the one who kills that monster. Whoever is a monster player wants to stay hidden long enough to cripple as many of the Hunters as they can. Will actually cripple all of them, picking them off one by one. And when they, he, he or she can do that, they're going to win the game. It's a bit more complicated than that, obviously, so let me go ahead and give you a brief look at how the game is played. Then we're going to come back, I'll let you know what I think. Okay, I'm going to give you a brief look at Hunt the Unknown Quarry. This is a competitive game for three to six players. The goal of the game is different, depending on what you are in the game, and we're going to get to that, but... Essentially, if you're the monster in the game amongst all of the other hunters, which is everyone else that's not you, you need to cripple all of the other players. There's no such thing as um, the hunters dying in this game. They're always alive and active in the game, but they can be crippled and uh, really hampered with their gameplay. But also, if all uh, potentially up to five other players are crippled, then the monster is able to escape and he wins the game on his own. However, if, the, if one of the hunters is able to kill and uh, deal a mortal wound to the monster, that one hunter wins the game. So this is not a cooperative or semi-cooperative game. The hunters are not, they, they can help each other, but only one person is going to win no matter what. All right, so there is uh, some setup stuff that we need to talk about. Every player is going to take a character card and a player shield. Um, so your player shield will have a picture of your character on the outside. And then on the inside is a lot of useful information, which isn't going to make a lot of sense yet. So we'll get back to that. But you also have a little uh, cheat sheet here where you're going to keep track of um, all of the deductive elements of the game. As you try to de deduce what... Um, elements make up the monster that you're facing. You also keep track of your life. You keep track of different um, information of where cards are potentially located if you want to. And you'll keep that uh, stowed away behind your screen uh, together with a writing utensil so the other players cannot see what you're marking down. Although, of course, they will see that you're marking down something. You also have your character card, which also... Um, there's a number of different character cards in the game, but they all have the same things written on them. There's no character or special abilities. Those come from items. So you have uh, six potential hunters that you're going to be using. I have Caitlyn here. Um, and the, the reason why you have to have a card, and you actually keep this outside of your screen, this keeps track of your energy. Energy is going to be sent, spent for certain special abilities, and when you use, and, and it'll list here what you can use them for, surging, which lets you add or subtract uh, one from a die result, adrenaline, which lets you take an extra action, or faint, which lets you ignore harassing players for this turn. Um, but you only get to do this twice before you have to recharge. So when you use your first energy, you'll uh, tap it to the side, and then when you use your second energy, you flip it over to your exhaust side and then you only get this back and flip it back over if you have done nothing on your turn then you get to flip it back but that's public knowledge for all the other players next as far as the boards go so I, I use the word board loosely these are paper mats but you have three different paper mats signifying the ground floor the upper floor and the lower floor and they're double-sided and slightly different on both sides so you can have a variable setup but you're always going to have three floors and everyone's going to start in the hallway of the ground floor so you have a uh, little standees with your character's picture on them uh, in typical victory point games fashion then you're going to set up all of the items that are in each room now i actually have less cards out here than there are supposed to be because 
I've stowed some cards off to the side to show you on camera as examples, but that's fine. Um, so in parentheses, next to the name of each different location, there's a number with potentially an asterisk. And what this is, is that's how many cards you have to randomly distribute out into each room on the board. Um, and if there's any leftover cards after you've distributed them all out, the extras get sifted out evenly into the rooms that have asterisks. But before you get to that, there's something important that you have to do. Also, you have these communal cards here that every player is going to take on their turn. Spy, Brawl, and Grab. These are things that you can always do on your turn. Um, there's, for whatever reason, well, because it's Victory Point Games, <laughs> and every player doesn't have their own set of these. You just have to keep them out next to the board and take them when it's your turn. But there's one important thing you need to do before you do anything else with the item cards, including setting them up, and that is dealing them out to the players. Now, every player is going to start off with two cards, okay? But there's a trick to this. Now, remember that there's one player is going to be the monster. How do you determine who the monster is? Well, that comes down to the um, placement of cards in the beginning or the dispersal of cards. So you have five monster cards, okay? These are cards that have monster special abilities. So for instance, um, they function just like item cards. I'll show you these first, I suppose. Uh, so you have magic, which down here it says that it affects uh, hunters. And it, you roll a die and then you'll get a special random action. You have resilience, which says that you show it to a player to negate any action targeting you with a roll of one or two. Showing it means just handing it to the player and letting them see it secretly. Uh, wasting, you roll a die, and if it comes up as three, five, or six, you'll get one of these special abilities, like wound, or force them to spend an energy, tireless, and bite, which gives you wounds, so on and so forth, right? Those cards don't get shuffled into the normal item cards as usual. Instead, at the beginning of the game, you're going to make a number of stacks of cards equal to the number of players in the game. One, so, for instance, if you're in a four-player game, you're going to have four stacks of two cards, one of those stacks of two cards is going to have two random monster cards. So it might be Bite and Tireless. All right, so that's one of the stacks. Then the other item cards are shuffled together and put, uh, you'll take two items each into the remaining piles that you need. Then you're going to shuffle them up on the table as best as possible, like move the piles around to randomize them. Close your eyes, <laughs> and then have another player shuffle them, essentially, so that no one knows which pile of the cards you're going to have is the monster pile. Then each player is going to secretly take a pile of those two cards, and only they can look at them. Whoever ended up with the monster cards is the monster. What type of monster are they? That is where your cheat sheet comes into play. Because on the cheat sheet, let's see if I can just show you this. It will tell you what the combination of special power cards makes you. So, for instance, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the names of some of these. But if you ended up with Tireless and Resilience, these are the icons for those two cards, you're a Golem. If you ended up with Magic and Wasting, you're a Warlock. And so on and so forth. And here's a little reminder of what each of the cards does as well. Now, it's important that both the monster and the players know this because... The items that you use in the game to wound each other, specifically if you want to wound the monster, only certain items, um, only, okay, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. A monster is only vulnerable to certain items. And because the other players don't know which monster cards were dealt out to the monster at the beginning of the game, and they don't know who the monster is even, they need to try and not only deduce who the monster is, but which type of monster they are so that they can figure out which weapons they're going to be vulnerable to. And that seems like as good a time as any to show you some of these cards. Um, so, for instance, well, we'll start off with one of my favorites just because it is a dog, of course. <laughs> uh, now, notice this ring of symbols around the edge here. Each of these has a symbol corresponding to one of the monsters. That tells you which monsters this card can be used against. So, uh, if in, in this case, it has um, the warlock symbol, and it has a vampire, and so on. And then, if you target someone with this card, um, and we'll get into like the actions and how you know how you take your actions and all that. But then you roll a die, and if uh, it comes up as a certain number, you show any card. If it comes up as a two, uh, a four or six, if it comes up as a two or three, you spend energy or you gain a wound. Uh, then you have Silver Knife, and notice how it has different symbols that it affects. That one can potentially make you show any card or spend an energy or a wound. The rifle hits a uh, large amount of 
different types of monsters. But it only hits on, it only does anything on a 1 or a 5. Um, the Shadow Crystal, this is a different one because this one isn't really going to deal any damage, but it's really good for deduction. If you roll a certain number, if um, it comes up as one of those numbers and that person happens to be the monster and happens to be one of those types of monsters, they have to show that you a card and that lets you get some information. Then you have special items like the Holy Symbol, which says you can show this to negate any monstrous action targeting you if the die roll was a 6, or the Druidic Charm, which lets you show it to negate a tar- magic action targeting you. Uh, so we'll get into all that and how combat works, but that's the kind of items you can expect to see. Oh, and I'm sorry, just to clarify one thing in case it uh, it wasn't obvious, I'm sure it wasn't actually. If you see symbols that have either a person, uh, what is a better example? That's a better example. If you see a person or a crossed out person, if it's uh, just a person, that means it affects anybody. If it has a crossed out symbol through it, that means it does not affect hunters. It only affects monsters, potentially. So that's, uh, and, and which makes sense for cards like the Shadow Crystal because this would only have anything to do with the monster. But okay, that's that. Let's get back to the actual gameplay. Now, how is the turn to turn, round to round gameplay going to work? Remember, oh, one other important thing. Once you had determined who got what cards, who the monster is, then you set up the room allotment and you actually take the other monster cards that you did not get deal out to a player and shuffle them into the item cards, which means they're going to be out there on the board somewhere. This is another important part of deduction because you're gonna be looking at these cards and potentially grabbing them. If you're a hunter, you can't grab the monster cards that are out there, but by seeing them, now you know what the monster is not. So if you see a magic card out here on the board, you know it's not a warlock. You also know it's not a lich or a, uh, uh, what, a fairy, for instance. Now, in a normal round of the game, each player takes four actions. You'll have a start player and then you're going to go around. In the first round of the game it's a bit weird because the, there's advantage. Um, so the first player only takes one action, second player takes two, two action, and so on. But after that everyone's going to be at normal four actions. And you can do a number of different things with those actions. The first thing you can do is move. You just move through connected rooms. You can, if, as long as you've got some sort of opening to go through, you can move from room to room. You can go up the stairs to a different floor, so long as it has an opening and a connection. Now, the only thing that can really hinder you, let me focus in a little bit here, when you try to move, is if a character has harassed you. If a character has interacted with you in some way, shape, or form, they're considered to be harassing you. So if they force you to look at a card, show a card, take a card, whatever the case might be, it's going to hinder your movement for the turn. It slows you down. So for every person in your room who has harassed you before you try to move out of it, you need to spend an extra action. If two people interacted with um, Caitlin here, my character, and I tried to move out, I'd have to spend a total of three actions just to move to the next room, and then I could do what I want. This is where that faint action from, you might remember from your energy card, comes into play, because you can ignore harassing players. You could also, remember, use energy to take an extra action um, or, or to modify your dice. Now, the next type of action that you can take, I'm just going to spread out my peoples here a little bit. The next type of action you can take is to search. If you're in a room with cards, you can pick up the cards and look at them. Uh, you don't show them to anyone else. You don't have to say anything about them. You just you can make notes on your sheet, whatever you want to do, but you don't do anything else with them. You don't take them right this moment. That's all one action. It's just looking at the cards. Then, one of the other actions is to pick up cards. You can take a card from the room as long as it's not monstrous. You get to look at the monstrous card and make a note of it, but you can't actually take it um, even if you are the monster. You already are whatever monster that you are. Now, you have a hand limit of four, or an item limit of four, um, and also, you can only take an item if you have searched the room the same turn, because you know what's there. If you leave the room, thematically, things could have got scattered about, and you don't know for sure that it's in the place that you left it, so you have to search, and if you want to pick up, you have to pick up and search in the same turn, and then you can pick up multiple times if you really want to, as long as you follow the hand limit. And then the final type of action is interaction, which I already mentioned. An interaction in this case is anything on a card that you want to use uh, against another player. So if I have the shotgun in my hand, well, let's see what I actually have, by the way. Um, I have the Aqua Fortis, which could potentially deal a wound and is only usable against certain monsters like the Golem. I could uh, be in this room with this other player who's like Morgan or something like that. Um, and say, well, I'm going to spend an action, and without saying anything out loud, I'm just going to take the card from my hand, this one is an action item, and I'm just going to hand it to the other player and roll a die. 
Or let me clarify that a bit. First, you roll the die and determine what your result is. If you're happy with the effect that would happen because of the die that you rolled and the number that came up, then you hand the card to the other player. They look at it, look at your die result, and apply the effect if it applies to them. For instance, if it was a monster and if I, and I rolled a six, they'd have to take two wounds. They would mark off two wounds on their checkbox on their character sheet. And you can use an item card, and this is important, I'll talk about this in my final thoughts. You can use an item card multiple times, but if you choose to withdraw the card after seeing the die result, it still counts as an action against you. Um, and remember, cards have various different effects. Sometimes you just have to um, show them a card. Sometimes you have to permanently give them the card. Sometimes you just have to hand them the card and show them the effect. And sometimes they'll do things like forcing them to lose energy instead of taking a wound. And sometimes they can have reaction cards that they'll hand back to you, like, hey, like a monster card that says, when you would be hit, show them this card. You don't take any damage. The end result of all this is taking wounds. Now, if a hunter takes three or more wounds, they become crippled. A crippled hunter is not out of the game. In fact, like I said earlier, you cannot die in this game, but you are severely hampered, and now the monster is one step closer to victory because all he has to do is cripple all the hunters. If he cripples his last hunter, he immediately wins the game because he can easily escape. Now, because of the sort of weird deductive elements of the game and how you have to keep things secret, you don't declare right away that you're crippled. Instead, the next time you would take a wound, you'll say that you're crippled so that um, the other players, uh, it, it gives the killer a chance to avoid detection by the other players. And there are, of course, downsides to being crippled. Um, you cannot spend energy. So even if you have energy remaining, you can't use any of it to do anything, even if you would be forced to do so by a card that someone's giving you. You cannot move more than two spaces per turn, and you, whenever you would interact with someone with an action card, if you roll a four, five, or um, you have to withdraw your card if you roll a four, five, or six. You can only do actions that require you to roll a one, two, or three. So it is severely debilitating. Um, then, however, if you're the monster and you've taken wounds, um, which is equal to the number of players in the game, so the monster is more resilient. In a six-player game, you have to deal a total of six wounds to him. Uh, but when that happens, you, the monster player announces it immediately, and um, each other player says, whether they're crippled or not, um, if all the other players are crippled, the monster still wins, <laughs> even then. However, if at least one other player isn't crippled, the monster is slain, and whoever dealt the last wound, even if it was a crippled player, is going to be the winner of the game. So that is essentially it. Uh, again, you're just... One player is a monster, the other players are the hunters. You're going around trying to find the... If you're a hunter, you want to find the, the right items necessary to kill the monster. If you're the monster, you want to stay hidden and uh, uh, get all corner all the other players, cripple them, take them out before they can take you out. The theme, or at least the idea of the theme, is strong with Hunt the Unknown Quarry. Uh, like I said in my intro, I like the idea of a bunch of investigators going to try and take out a monster, and it's one of you, but if this isn't a betrayal game, you know right away that one of you is a monster, it's just a matter of who it is, and waiting for that other wheel to turn. And the fact that you can go against each other and just attack each other, even if you're both humans, um, whether either because you just want to get your rival out of the picture as much as possible, which isn't as viable a strategy, or just because you want to find out whether they're the monster or not, um, definitely means that makes this game competitive, but also gives you more of a sense of tension. So I think the theme is solid, at least in idea, but we'll circle back around to that in a minute. Uh, as far as the components go, it's a victory points games game, which means that the components are substandard compared to a lot of other publishers' games. Maybe not Mayfair, which is really awful, but <laughs> Victory Point games are pretty bad. Now, compared to other Victory Point games, I think it looks good. I like the artwork. It's the same artwork from Darkest Night and a few other other games as well, and I really like that. I want to see that in more games, as a matter of fact. Um, but it's paper mats. As good as they look, they're still paper mats, and they still crease up and they're kind of low quality and the cards are all low quality and cut wrong which means that if you try to shuffle them they shuffle very weirdly and if you you know put them in a stack and hold and put them up you can see that they're all cut poorly um there's only one die in the box which i'm like all right everyone's got d6s i know but still it would be nice if there's enough in the box itself for everyone to not have to pass the same die around constantly. Standees and the, the screens aren't that great. Again, it's a victory point games. I've been pretty forgiving of them in the past, but there has been such a 
large amount of games from many publishers, not just the typical uh, Fantasy Flight and Asmodee, who have been putting really good uh, components in their boxes. And I feel like it's you really can't do this anymore. I mean, companies that probably don't even uh, move the number of products that Victory Point Games does have better component quality. So I don't really understand what's going on there. But okay, let's move on from that. On to the mechanisms of the game. In theory, this thing works. In theory. In practice, it really doesn't. I like the idea of it. I like that um, you one of you is randomly a monster. And the two monster cards that you get determine what kind of monster you, you, you is. You are. Which I like a lot, actually. It's a cool idea. Because now it's like, oh, we need... It's deduction. I like deduction. We need to figure out what this monster is, then we can kill it. And of course you want to be the only one that kills it. And I'm even okay with the semi-co-op element in theory. That doesn't always work in every game, and part of me wants the game to be fully cooperative, but it does not it's not bad as a fully competitive game if some of the mechanisms work properly. First and foremost, I do think that the, the term fiddly gets thrown around too much, primarily by me. I fully admit that. But this is what I'm talking about when I talk about fiddliness, because... A fiddliness that drags you right out of the theme. So that's why I said the theme is good in theory, but not necessarily in practice. Because you have to, it's everything is just like, move some cards around, look at the cards, make a note. Uh, then it's like, uh, pass the card to you. Okay, roll a die, then see what it is. Then pass the card back. Okay, what does it say? Okay, then you do this. There's so much shuffling around of cards, taking notes, looking at things, it drags you completely out of the theme. There's no suspense, there's no stress. It turns into a bookkeeping exercise at a certain point. And it's just like, uh, okay, all I'm trying to do now is just find out what the monster is and kill it. That's it. There's no, like, uh, there's no role-playing, which, I mean, in a game like this, maybe there shouldn't be, but there should be a little bit. There should be a little bit of, like, acting like you're investigators, investigating some sort of murder or monster. It's just strictly move to here, shuffle some cards, look at them, take this one, get rid of this one, put this one back, uh, make a note. None of it feels very thematic at a certain point. But all right doesn't necessarily mean the game is bad. The, the gameplay itself could more than make up for that, but it doesn't. Few issues here, to be sure. First off, the whole system of flipping cards back and forth. The idea that you can use a card more than once kills a lot of the combat in this game. If you get the right card against the right person who can't defend against it, or if you are um, the monster and you have the perfect block for the one item that that hunter could hit you with, and just keep using it again and again and again, the person who's on the losing end of that is just like, well, nothing I can do. <laughs> and the other person can just keep whomping them with it again and again. Items should be either once per round, or some of them should just be once and done, you drop it, or something. And it has to recharge. Or you have to use your energy to recharge it. Something like that. And by the way, the energy system, I like it. It would have been nice if the characters actually had special, specific abilities. Might have been a neat thing. But I digress from my other topic. So that's a problem right then and there. Another problem is the fact that once a player is crippled... There's a couple things about this. Once a player is crippled... You may, there's a rule that says you don't announce it right away to give the killer a chance to escape. Everyone knows. Everyone can keep track of the amount of times you are handed a card and you very clearly write on your pad. You could, I don't know, mimic and fake it, but it doesn't really make it explicitly clear that you should be doing that. So it's very clear that something's going on. Oh, and by the way, even though it's not thematic at all, if there are a bunch of players down in the basement but you and one other player are duking it out up in the, the attic, <laughs> everyone can see that. Everyone can see, oh, you guys have spent your last three turns pummeling each other to death. Now, you can attack other hunters, but it doesn't make a lot of strategic sense to do so in most cases. So you're clearly one of you is the monster. And oh, look, the person who is constantly writing stuff down and is now limping away, I'm going to guess that person's not the monster. Now, of course... That's not the entirety of the game. You still need to find a weapon that can kill it. But there's a lot of weapons that deal damage to a lot of different things. And you can hold four cards. So <laughs> once someone knows what the monster is because some other poor sap got attacked first or found stumbled onto the monster first, well, then it's just a matter of going and finishing their dirty work if they were able to hurt it at all. Because again, you might just get stuck with bum cards that either can't hurt the monster or they can hurt the monster, but the monster has specific abilities that say, oh, 
uh, yeah, you, you don't hit on a 5 or a 6 or whatever the case might be. Or it might be vice versa. The monster could be screwed. I actually think overall the game is tougher for the monster. It's just much easier for a hunter to snipe out another hunter uh, because they were just unlucky. And by the way, the idea that uh, being crippled just means that you're still in the game is great on paper. Like, oh, no player elimination in the game. Love it. Now I don't have to worry about just sitting here while the rest of you play. But you kind of still do. Because when you're crippled, forget about it. Theoretically, you can still win the game. But you are so hampered. Being only able to move two spots, having most of your options killed for rolling dice and being able to activate cards where you can't activate on four, five, or six anymore. Which again, you might just have like cards in your hand that say, oh, um, this is the only card that can hurt you but it only if I roll a four, five, or six, which I can't do now. So now I have to frantically look for another card that can hurt you, assuming there is another one anywhere close to where you are because you can only move two spaces on your turn. You can't use your energy anymore. You are essentially eliminated from the game. They're just not saying that. So I like the idea of the game. But there's so many frustrating little things like that. The fiddliness of it. Be, the anticlimactic nature of it. The let me w- let someone else uh, take the initial blows and whittle down the monster a little bit. And then I'll just swoop in and take my due time. There's there's just no tension or, or uh, sense of adventure or um, edge of your seat stress to the game. As the theme would imply, it's just a little bit of bookkeeping. A little bit of very generic deduction followed by really hoping you get lucky. And if you don't, you are hobbling around useless until the game mercifully ends. So really did not like this one. I had high hopes for it. I like the designer. I like his previous work. I like the artwork. I like the theme. But everything else from components to gameplay felt very, very flat for me. Sadly so. I really wanted to like it. That is Hunt the Unknown Quarry from the Three Point Games. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.